I particularly like the way it doesn't say there's one big thing which will drive this change. There's a combination of three forces uh, which amount to not only driving radical change but also changing the terms of what that change is really about. As compared with fossil fuels get too expensive, it's almost the converse because they're squeezed out by the other forces going on. Um, and I also like very much the way uh, that Dieter then moved swiftly from that into saying, so what's that actually going to mean? And I think it's, it's, it's really his ability to sort of pull together narratives on what that could mean for different regions of the world for corporate structures, uh, which really makes us pretty, pretty unique. Um, and... and some of the geopolitical chapters are actually quite fun. Well, much of it's fun to read as well, but I think particularly some of the stories woven in there. And some of you think, yeah, boy, I wouldn't like to be in that region given, given what is uh, coming. So that's quite an achievement. Um, now, the energy landscape actually has a tendency to be somewhat d dominated by, by geeks uh, or by those with, with particular sort of angles on it or axes to grind. So, again, it's quite refreshing to get something... Um, that tries to integrate right across those spans and to integrate the climate and the fossil fuel worlds, etc. But of course, there's going to be a but. Uh, so I will add in, add in at least my, my buts. I think experts in some of the regions probably can come forward with, with some of the buts and aspects. Um, just, but given just a, a few minutes, let me zero in a little on, on a particular angle of this, as illuminated, pardon the pun, by uh, Dieter's focus on solar. Which, which actually like in the first place, because Dieter was very explicit, the, it is not that some magic technology will arrive from heaven and save us from doing anything difficult, right? We have a few known physical resources. The question is our ability to <coughs> transform those into useful stuff for, for our economies. Um, I think it's the single most, solar is the single most important resource, and it's also the single biggest technical change. The buts come in because I think there's some quite important glossing over, um, some of which I touched on, on in the review in Nature that um, Dieter referred to. Um, dominant issue, of course, in, in temperate zones like Britain, solar in, in winter is less than a tenth of the intensity of what it delivers in summer. It's a huge gap. Solar is not going to cover our winter energy needs. Um, and I just don't see any credible storage technology that would provide the interseasonal inter storage there, whilst I think storage is hugely important for the day-to-day -day fluctuations, day-night. Um, so I think there's, there's got to be, at least for a country like Britain, a large dose of complementary technologies in that story. Uh, I think uh, you can have float various candidates, but the most obvious one, which is counter-cyclical to that in seasonal terms, is wind energy. Um, and I did feel, actually, that they just got slightly stuck, or he has fa failed to overcome, I think, some of his... Uh, historical antipathy for wind, if I dare put it like that. Um, and it seems a shame because I think the story is actually logically quite a lot stronger yeah. if you, if you yeah. mesh those two together in complementary ways. That's right. Um, but I, I think then the second sort of big but is around how technology develops. Um, in, in, in chapter two, it sets out what well, is a sort of classic dichotomy in economics between sort of current technologies and future technologies. As if future technologies are somehow radically different and they'll arrive from manna, manna from heaven or because you put some money to R&D. Actually, the real innovation which has changed the landscape in the way that Dieter is referring to is largely, yes, elements of R&D certainly, but it's a function of investment, trial and error, building up industries, building up supply chains, building up markets, learning by doing, adjusting the adoption of infrastructure, the regulatory structures, etc. Um, I think we will get more and more, ra more radical innovations in solar, um, but that's partly because it's now obvious to the corporate and finance sectors that there's huge amounts of money to be made by the companies that come forward with those radical innovations, which was not the case when solar was kind of diddly squat on the energy landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I think underlying this, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly a complaint directed at DITA, in my view, and um, that's kind of why I wrote this, this other sort of big theoretical tome. It's a problem in economics. Most economics has a very weak, if any, coherent theory of innovation. 
particularly as it plays out in something like the energy sector. And um, so I think, I actually think we should be humble enough to acknowledge that we've got the renewables revolution, partly because policymakers in key countries completely ignored the advice of many economists. Yeah. Um, and they <laughs> did throw a lot of money at it. There is then a uh, sort of third area I'll touch on and then I'll finish, which is in places, um, I felt the book slightly spoiled its message by, by uh, a, a touch of politicization, or maybe that's not quite the right one word, couldn't resist the temptation to throw a lot of mud at the policymakers, particularly in Britain and Europe. And yet when you kind of look at what I see as the sort of the evolutionary theories of how major structural innovations and systems occur, maybe it wasn't such dumb ideas to invest a lot in technological transformation in the energy sector. Um, and yet, you know, we, we acknowledge the German energy vendors cost 20 billion euros a year. It's kind of interesting. That's not a crippling burden. It's actually in what seems to be the most successful economy in Europe by many measures. Um, even though the Germans somewhat underestimated the ability of the Chinese to move in on the supply chain pretty rapidly, there's no sign of Germany pulling back on the fundamentals of that. They have had to balance the coal politics versus renewable politics, I agree. Um, but I think that, that momentum is there, and we should kind of at least acknowledge somebody had to make very big investments to crack this, just in the way that we made huge investments in the beginning of the 1970s in what seemed like a ridiculous proposition of trying to get oil out of the North Sea, which was ludicrously expensive at the time. Um, so that may be a kind of retort of the geeks, um, as, but as Dieter said in, in his opening remarks, we may be looking at review of energy policy after the next election, in which I think as well as understanding the big picture, it is also important to get the details right. Uh, and I do agree with much of what Dieter said on the structural implications and the zero marginal cost and the transformation. That means we had to get the system economics right of a transforming system. Um, but at the end of the day, as a con concluding remark, uh, I think one of the problems in energy, at least in the electricity sector that I inhabit mostly, is we do tend to treat it as a very technocratic issue. Well, actually, history teaches us that energy is one of the big economic sectors in our society and in the geopolitics of the world. And I think in mapping that out, I think Dieter's done us all a huge service. Thank you. Uh, two big themes that came to me from Dieter's book that I think he's absolutely correct on. Uh, the first is that we're on a transition from a uh, fossil fuel dependent world to an electricity dependent world. Uh, room for fossil fuels in that world, but it's not the work room it's got now. I think that's absolutely correct. That transition has got many drivers, uh, but we're making that's the path we're on. Now, we can argue about how fast and what is in that path, uh, but I don't think really we can argue uh, that that's the path. The second uh, thing I think is very good and central theme of Dieter's book is the past is a lot less uh, of a useful guide to the future than it used to be. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, almost all of our decision makers, whether they're corporate or political, are much more inclined to be informed by the past than they are by the future. So there's a sort of structural problem in how we deal with the politics of this. I, I learned early in my career about the, um, the, the difficulty of that doing the um, wind scale inquiry and its... Uh, 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 subsequent pieces, I quite by chance came across a quote which is stuck in my mind from Macaulay, which has been a guide to me ever since as I've addressed these questions. He said, you must remember that argument is constructed in one way and government in entirely another. <laughs> and what I would like to see to complement Dieter's sort of charting of that pathway is perhaps we need to do a sort of equivalent charting of what the political politics are in as much sort of systematic detail because I think we don't grasp the difference between policy and politics enough uh, and that you can actually do much more systematics about politics than people often think. Just by way of, of a, a couple of observations, that graph that Dieter put up of 
how the IEA gets it wrong. He could have put up a lot of graphs like that. The IEA's total consistency is about forecasting the future incorrectly, which it's done, I think, consistently for 30 years. And one of the things that shapes the political and corporate perspectives of this future and this transition is the graph that gets published in every outlook in the IEA and the EIA, the American equivalent. They all show uh, a future out to 2040 and 2050 with a lot more fossil fuels and a yeah. tiny amount of renewables at the top. Yeah. What that, and that chart, frankly, influences most corporate and political decisions. What they don't show you is that the renewables don't have to replace all those bottom thirds. They only have to replace 30% of it because 60% of the, the fossil fuel use is just waste heat. Uh, and the renewables are not going to replace that waste heat because they're delivering electricity which won't have that waste heat. So we have a very fundamental, as a collective view, of what the challenge is as we make that transition from fossil fuels out. It's a lot less difficult than it might look if you look at that uh, IEA graph. And th that's the thing that's driving political and corporate perceptions which means we'll go, as Dieter's in sense saying, we're going to actually move down that pathway a lot faster than most of the current decision makers uh, think. The climate constraint on that, another one of these methodological distortions, none of those um, uh, graphs have any factor in them allowing for the fact that actually as you go from one degree warmer to two degrees warmer, you might have some impact on the growth that you're forecasting to drive that use of fossil fuels. Uh, that, that growth, uh, by the time you're getting into the two part of that period, that impact might be most significant. But none of those forecasts, none of those models contain a factor for what the impact and growth of a changing uh, climate will be. On, on the politics of it, um, in a sense, the, the original, the, the classic current politics still, is basically governments face a choice of whether you back today's winners, the oil fossil fuel industry, against tomorrow's possible winners and uh, a lot of long run out maybe tomorrow's losers. That graph, that fundamental political situation is really changing much faster than politics is appreciated. It's now not just tomorrow's winners, it's tomorrow's winners against today's winners and actually today's losers, because we're beginning to see losers already appear uh, as companies like Unilever and Nestle begin to look at what's happening under a very small degree of climate change to the impacts on their um, uh, uh, supply chain. So don't assume that the politics of today and the political equations of today where that carbon constraint that you've seen again in the past, it may be a very different political equation as those imperatives begin to feed into that, that equation. I think Dito was absolutely right when he was focusing on the um, uh, electricity uh, question and what it, it, the, the, almost all of our debate about the future of electricity currently is a debate about what technology you choose. And that's the wrong debate. The debate is, as Dieter pointed out, it's one of what's your system architecture. Yeah. It's about how the system, and by the way, uh, Michael, we don't, we don't know how to do the economics of valuing systems either. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. And what is, what is the value of a system as opposed to individual bits of that system. But it, the system architecture debate is one that hasn't started yet. And when you look at that in terms of what do you think might win or not? Well, you have, a, in a sense, a choice. Our current choice is to have a small number of decision makers make a very small number of very big decisions that are very capital intensive and have a very big gap between a spend starting and revenues flowing. And we have a choice now, and this is what is, in a sense, the challenge Dieter is saying, to come up with a system architecture in which a large number of decision makers make a very large number of small decisions which are not very capital intensive and which have a very small gap between uh, spend starting and revenues flowing. Now, which do you think is going to win in a turbulent world in which the cost of capital has only got one way to go? Oh, and by the way, politically, the first system gets you a bill through the door and you can have an argument about whether that bill is, should go up or down or how much it is. The second system offers you the prospect of not only getting a bill through the door, but also getting a check through the door. And, and so th that's the sort of change in policy that Dita's talking about that we need uh, to address towards the end of it. I'm not hopeful 
that the current government will be up for making that kind of change. Thank you, John. John. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, John Moylan, industry correspondent at the BBC. Um, I get to spend about half my time. Can speak up a bit? That's fine. All right. Thanks. I get to spend around half my time uh, doing energy. Uh, stories. Richard uh, called me uh, on the phone. He said, "You know, you you cover this from a sort of an industry consumer point of view. Come along and make make about three points." And then he uh, then the phone went quiet. He said, "Actually, make about." I think it was five points because there's some other guys on the panel. And that, now I'm wishing I made about seven points. Or eight points right? <laughs> so, and just to be clear, you know, my thoughts today, it's not a BBC view of the energy world. It, you know, it's, it's just my views and observations from the fact that I started off as an engineer. I spent 15 years in, in business journalism and I've, I've had a chance to get out and about and see these extraordinary pieces of energy infrastructure around the world um, so, and, 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 and learn something about uh, the endeavors to make, to, make, to make it all work. And the first thing I would say is, you know, again, I've managed to get through a lot of it. And, you know, it's a, I, just, it, I thought it was a really great, readable, accessible contribution to, you know, this massively uh, uh, important debate. And for somebody who has spent most of my life, professional life, trying to communicate on difficult, important subjects, um, you know, it's incredibly impressive how, uh, how authoritative and ambitious it is. And I want to sort of jump into sort of two or three of the, of, the, of the really controversial aspects of it, about oil price, about the future of these really big uh, companies, about what you say on, on renewables, and, and inevitably for a, a BBC journalist to ask the question, what does it all mean for consumers? <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, first on the oil price, uh, it's, it's, it's perhaps the, you know, you're making a, a really big call, and it forces all of us to kind of recalibrate our thinking uh, a bit. Not only that oil prices may not rise, but that they are forever doomed to, to, to head lower. And we all know how historically it's been hard to predict, although your graph is quite compelling about you know, the, the, the direction of travel. And I, I find myself thinking about the factors which could, you know, if, if are we really losing touch with supply and demand? And, and if not, what are the factors which are affecting demand as, as, as we look forward? And I'm really glad, based on what's been said this morning, that the first source I went to was the International Energy Agency. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, their last, you know, back in November, they published their last outlook, and uh, they see demand growing for decades, um, out until 2040. Um, I think the quote was, peak oil demand is not in sight, I think is what they were saying. Um, although they said demand would grow at a slower pace. And if you look at the outlooks that the companies themselves produce, um, they also see demand going up certainly until the mid-2030s uh, 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 and that, in, in that sort of area. But what will keep demand, if they're right, what would keep demand rising? There's 1.2 billion cars out there right now, 1.2 billion internal combustion engines, I saw a figure that suggests by 2030 there'll be 2 billion. Now there's absolutely no doubt, and it feels right now like we're, we're really about to move into this electric, electric, electric uh, era, and it could all happen quite fast, but I find myself wondering, in Europe maybe, how quickly is that going to happen in, in India? How quickly is it going to happen in, in, in other parts of the world? And even if, we can, even if our light vehicles go electric, what happens to the JCB that digs up our streets? What happens to those enormous trucks that, you know, in, in, in mines in South America, etc.? So there's a lot of transport out there which will struggle. Um, what happens about shipping? Uh, what happens about airplanes? You know, I don't think we're going to be going on holiday in airplanes with electric engines for, for a while. Um, what happens about the big heavy industries? Um, uh, you know, we're not going to be running Port Tolbert on wind turbines, you know? Um, and what happens about a feedstock for the chemicals industry, maybe? Uh, and agriculture. So it just struck me that there is, there's a huge inertia out there. There's this huge base of fossil fuel burning. And I find myself wondering, that, that in some way has got to, 
that's got to do something about demand. And all, all I've known about the oil market for the past 15 years, 20 years, as I've, as I've been reporting on it, is that supply and demand seem to matter. But I take your point that you know, supply is in an extraordinary place. Um, so the drivers of demand are there for decades to come. And then, so then on this, your second point about what does it mean for the companies and the era of the big oil companies? Um, can they adapt uh, to all of this? Or should they, uh, you know, as, as, as proposed, should they harvest and exit? So should they, they liquidate themselves over the next 20, 30 years? So to be absolutely clear, I, I'm absolutely not here to defend big oil at all or what they're doing, but I get a chance uh, to speak to them, and I probably speak more to the European oil companies than the American oil companies. And, you know, maybe I'm being spun, but when I spend time with them, it's my impression that the industry recognizes that it needs you know, models for sustainable energy business in the future, um, and that it knows that it has to go in a certain direction of travel. That's my, that's my impression. And you will have seen over the past couple of years, there's been a number of announcements um, that different firms have made. Total made that big move into battery technology uh, uh, some time ago. Um, I think Shell planned to spend about a billion a year in renewable type technologies by the end of, by the end of this decade. Tiny part of their capex, but it shows you, if you like, a direction of travel. And then there was that oil and gas uh, uh, initiative, oil, oil and gas climate initiative last year where 10 big companies got together. They put in, from recollection, about a, was it a billion pounds over 10 years to spend on some aspects of, of tackling their impact on climate change. And of course, that's 100 million a year for an industry that spends you know, 25, 30 billion dollars a year on R&D. So it's tiny. But you know, the detractors could rightly say this is greenwash. And actually, what they want to do is just keep on pumping. Uh, but it's not nothing. Is it enough? I don't know. There's a, there's a, there's a, bit, there's a debate to be had. Maybe they're, they're starting to hedge their, they're starting to hedge their bets. The other thing that struck me is the role that these big companies play in the global financial system. Um, you know, a company like Shell is the biggest dividend player in the world. Um, it pays $15 billion of dividends. Uh, every year. These companies generate huge taxes for governments. Um, so when I look at all of this and I, and I think of the role that these companies have played in, in the world over the years, I find myself thinking they've probably got the resources to change if they, if they want to. They can probably afford to hire the smartest people to try and transition and make this change if they want to. And, and many of them are big national champions and it will be in the, the government's interest to make sure that they, that, that they don't go away. Um, so whether they'll wither, I don't know, time will tell. On renewables, just a, a point on renewables. Um, your idea that maybe you know, the current generation of renewables, I think you think are too expensive, and we should just pump a lot of money into next generation, and, and, and that would help to, you know, to save us. And I think we all know that the cost of current generation renewables has been falling fast. Um, and I think there was a, um, a um, in Germany, there was a subsidy-free round of offshore wind recently. Yeah, but not a system cost. Exactly. No, it wasn't a system cost. Not you're quite right. Free. No, you're, you're quite right. It wasn't free. It wasn't free. But it tells us something. The direction of travel. Um, should it... 56 pounds a megawatt hour with the system cost. Yeah. Yeah, but if you don't like that... So should we invest in next generation of renewables? Without system Absolutely, cost. we should. When you put the Absolutely. system cost in free. But, you know, I, I'm an ex-engineer. I started out my, my career in a research laboratory. And I saw something of, of how you take something from a lab into mass deployment. And it's really hard. It takes time. And, you know, and I worked on Tomorrow's World. And how many of those stories that, that we did on Tomorrow's World you know, never came to fruition? Whatever happened to the hovercraft? You know? <laughs> um, and so you know, think of something like the mobile phone. I remember my dad coming in with this mobile phone, a car phone, in the mid-'80s. You know, and you know, he may as well have walked in with flying saucer yeah. because we just thought it's extraordinary. You're telling me you call people on this thing, you know, extraordinary. And you know, 15 years later, I'm doing pieces for one o'clock news saying, Can you believe it? There's five million people in the UK have now got a mobile phone, and of course, today there's 4.7 billion people have got a mobile phone around the world. Now, that, that was a genuine revolution, but probably from the lab to the end took about 
40 years, 50 years. So these things will take a long time. And I worry about a concept that says, forget about current generation renewables and move straight into deploy to putting lots of money into what, what could happen further down the line. And just a, a, a final thought on what does it all mean for consumers? Which is the question I'm asked by bulletin editors every time I sell a story uh, to them. Um, and I could, I mean, to, in truth, when I looked at the book, I couldn't quite navigate it. If oil prices are going down, traditionally they've been tied to gas prices. That sounds like lower wholesale prices in the future, but clearly we're going to have to have more renewables. There'll be policy costs, carbon pricing. That could make uh, uh, prices go up. Um, what's clear is that consumers, it feels like we're in an era where consumers are about to get a lot more control over their energy bills, the ability to be more energy efficient, uh, smart meters, you know, apps that allow you to put on your heating when you're on your way home, etc. Um, uh, prosumers, you generate your own energy and you, you use your own energy. So there's a lot happening that, that could help consumers uh, in all of this. Um, but it feels right now in the debate in the UK, we've had this trilemma of you know, security of supply and cost and how do, you, how do you meet our, our, our climate goals? And it feels like at the moment, security of supply and cost are in the ascendancy in, in that debate. And when I find myself asking the questions, how will consumers fare in this vision in the future? I find myself thinking, well, if the current political climate tells us anything, it's probably that the government of the day won't allow consumers to pay too much. And if we need a demonstration of that, we probably just need to look at the Tory party manifesto <laughs> when it's published in a few days' time. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, all the panellists. Um, on, on that note, I'm going to only ask one question to all of you and then throw it open to the floor. But um, if you were the person writing the party manifestos, not only the Tory manifesto, but any of the party manifestos right now, what, what's the one thing that you would be telling them to put in those manifestos? Maybe if we go from this, from this side. I rather hope that they write very little. Yes. <laughs> because the trouble with party manifestos is that someone, somebody, brilliant person of a think tank or elsewhere, comes up with some flashy things to put in the manifesto. They write it all down. They spend five years regressing they ever did it. So I would, my answer to your question is, as little as possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, I'd do it one sentence. We're going to give you an electricity system in which you get a, a check as well as a bill. That's good. <laughs> I'm horribly tempted to go with Dita. I, I, um, I mean, we, we spent four years trying to navigate our way out of a market that was totally based on short-run yeah. wholesale prices uh, because it just wouldn't actually cut the mustard in the kind of new world that we're looking at. Uh, I think the energy market reform absolutely has its flaws and absolutely some of them are going to really need fixing, but I'm not sure that should be the priority in the next few years or even, or even perhaps the next parliament other than to think through seriously what do we need in the 2020s as we get there. But I think at the moment the last thing the industry needs is a sense the whole thing's going to be torn up again uh, and, and thrown around. That's a kind of personal view, but um, there is lots that will need to be developed and fixed if we maybe can slightly depoliticize energy. Boy, that would help as well. That's why you keep it out of a manifesto. Well, uh, well, but yeah, what you have to remember is the principal driver of the politics of energy is what's in the headlines, not what's in the analyses. Yeah. I, hope, I, mean, I, I hope that whatever is there is sufficiently vague and sufficient, oh. sufficiently uh, flexible yeah. and that they, they haven't come to one conclusion which hasn't been tested and thoroughly worked out. So I hope that there's enough room for manoeuvre that in the aftermath and if whatever is there is consulted on, that there's an opportunity for us to really try and work through which of these options is the right one. Brilliant. Um, I will throw it open. We've got about 15, 20 minutes left, so I'll throw it open to some questions. We'll have a roving mic and the house rule is that no question is too outrageous, but you have to state your name and organisation uh, before <laughs> you do so. So let's start right at the front. Front row. Uh, Graham Meeks at uh, Green Investment Bank. Um, Dita, you, you, you sort of build a lot of the premise of, of your argument on the, on the digitalization of, of the economy. I guess my question is how do you digitalize heat loss, or more accurately, how do you digitalize insulation, prevention of heat loss? Because that is linked to 
somewhere between 40, 20 and 40 percent of the energy consumption in our economy. That is primarily served by fossil fuels, natural gas in, in the main. Um, and as you say, with, natural with, with fossil fuel prices coming down, I guess natural gas will follow your oil, your oil price view, um, it becomes cheaper and therefore easier for people to not take action to, to address that heat loss. So where, where, where does, the, where does the, 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 the heat loss piece fit in with your view of the world? Okay, so uh, a couple of points. Um, the first point is that my view about where oil prices are going doesn't actually depend on digitalization. So each of the three structural changes I've got do not depend upon each other for the assertions that I make about them. They really do interact, but I think fossil fuel prices will come down even uh, because of my analysis of supply and demand, and I think that long-run trend in the BP diagram will happen. Secondly, um, and I kind of haven't had time to explore this at length, there is a, you, you've got to be very careful whether you're talking about gas or, or, or oil. Okay, so people here, I mean, I, I'm old enough to have done my doctoral thesis, which I was looking at yesterday, it finished in 1984 on a typewriter with Tipex and carbon paper, and there was a mention about how fast mobile technology came through. But in 1990, which is more recent, it was still illegal to burn gas in power stations in the United States and Europe because we didn't think we had very much gas. So, the, so one of the big changes which shapes what goes forward, which isn't drawing from the past, is gas is a very big part of this picture. And, and John, that's part of petrochemical part of the demand, and that's why I don't see just take the number of vehicles and extrapolate and think, well, maybe electric cars will do some of that. There's gas in that story in, in transport, and there's gas in that story in petrochemicals. And that's why you see some of the oil companies moving towards the gas space. Okay? Now, on heating, I don't go in the book through each particular domain of decarbonisation. It would be good to do that, but the book doesn't hang on those particular component parts. That said, the problem you highlight is extraordinarily important. Okay. And the question that we have in the decarbonisation world is our tendency to focus on things we can, we think we can fix and just ignore these things to the side. So do I think there are any existing technologies that are going to do this at relatively low cost at the moment? I actually don't think there are. I think that's why it's so difficult. But have we got to do it? Yes. And then what follows from that in terms of what technologies we're going to use? And there are a huge number of issues which you're much more expert at than I am, and Tom and others know about more than I do. Sorry, just one of the detail highlighted in a sense one of the things that gets us all mixed up about this. We talk about energy as if it were one thing, and yeah. actually it isn't. You've got absolutely completely different markets that work in different ways. As Dieter says, they interact with each other, but they actually have completely different yeah. dynamics. Yeah. Uh, heat, and, and they also have different drivers. Uh, the, there's an enormously potent driver for heat, which is about fuel poverty and about health, mm -hmm. and about how you maintain uh, 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 temperatures in people's homes, in which the answer to which we know what we haven't solved are the system problems of delivering those answers to people in, a, in an efficient and, and cost-effective way. But to take out a big chunk of that heat problem is, is about how you solve a problem for the health service and, and for poverty, uh, simply by insulating people's houses properly, making them heat tight. Um, that's not all of the problem, but it's a very big part of it. So the, if I love my, can have my own response, we, we looked at this in the report we did last year called Too Hot to Handle, and this is one area where I think the electrification of, of everything is, is really quite difficult. Yes. Oh, it's, right. yeah, it's extremely Agreed. difficult, mainly because peak heating demand is something like 300 gigawatts in the UK, and if you try and electrify that, then you've, you've got real problems. Um, I think we worked out that in order to do it in the way that the deck heat strategy uh, suggested would cost about 300 billion pounds. Um, so that tells you uh, why that probably isn't the answer and why a bit of energy efficiency um, is probably a sensible place to start. Let's take another question uh, from the second row here. Yeah, just Benny. Uh, Benny Pizer from the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Um, Dieter, I think the key contradiction in your book and in your thesis is the following. You're saying uh, because of the shale revolution, uh, oil and gas prices are, are, are um, likely going down rather than up or stabilizing at a comparatively low cost. There will be hundreds of years of cheap and abandoned fossil fuels as a result, but governments actually won't 
use that anymore because of decarbonization. So you're, you're making a very strong argument that despite um, fossil fuels actually becoming cheaper and the big kind of technological breakthrough not being in the renewables but in the fossil fuel sector because obviously the shale revolution is the biggest energy revolution we've seen in the last 20, 30 years and has basically lengthened the bridge to the renewables and making renewables even less competitive. You're still saying governments won't adopt or won't adopt policies that will go for cheap and abundant and fairly reliable forms of conventional mm -hmm. energy. Have you ever considered that the speed of decarbonization might slow? You said climate change is not going away, I agree. But the speed of climate change might turn out to be less dramatic okay. as, as the models predict. And you, you okay. yourself said okay. you know, some of the kind okay. of old consensus turned out to be wrong. So if climate change doesn't accelerate uh, as fast as the models predict, could you see the policy appetite for more expensive forms of energies actually uh, becoming less and the appetite for cheap energy becoming more? Okay, let, let me unpack that because you make a, 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 a series of very important points, okay? So it is true that I'm saying that the assumption that people made over the last 10 years of high and ever-rising oil and gas prices is incorrect. And the assumption that, uh, particularly I remember it in, in Brussels, the assumption was very clear that by 220, gas price in particular would be so high that the renewables would not need any subsidy whatsoever because, you know, basically Germany and Europe will have led the world, they got their bet right, and the fossil fuel dominated economy that George W. Bush was pursuing against the Europeans would land them in serious trouble. And the US would be full of very expensive fossil fuels, the petrochemical industry would be, I mean it's a flippant remark because it's not quite true, but almost flocking to Aberdeen to get near the cheap offshore wind relative to the price of oil. Okay? And I always have argued, and I've done this for more than a decade, and it's been very lonely until recently, I've always argued that's nonsense. Okay? So now, you, now what I'm saying is the oil price of $50 is actually quite high. Okay? And for any market where the marginal cost is 10 or less, or 20 in Russia, and it's abundantly supplied, and the cost of US shells are very low, it is a very high price. It's $30 more than even the Russian marginal cost. Okay? Now, but in any historical term, actually it's still quite high. Right? Okay? So if you take the full line of that diagram, which includes all of that early period of kerosene, etc., the average price is 34. And of course, I think about 2004, the price went up from $10 to about 25 Okay, So I'm saying, let's rebase the fossil fuel line against which we're thinking about the way we subsidize and the way we use customers' money to do stuff. So it doesn't follow from the fact that I'm just saying, you're wrong to think these very high prices are here for good and you should base your policy on that. That therefore, the decarbonisation policy is derailed. It simply says you were naive to think it was going to be really easy. And this feeds into my view that converting from a carbon economy to a low carbon economy is a bit like going from a peacetime economy in 1936 in, in, in Europe to a wartime economy by 1941. You've got to change the entire structure of the economy. Of course it's going to cost. And that was my criticism of Stern about the true costs of making those adjustments. Now, do I think the politicians will iterate from the lower prices and therefore slow down on their attempts to reduce climate change. Well, I have to say you're right in one respect. They clearly are at the moment. Right? There is much less appetite in the US and in quite a number of European countries to do what um, would be necessary to achieve the two degree target. And I might make myself very clear and pin my uh, colours to the mast. I think it's really important to get on with it. Okay? Now, how will that pan out? Well, there are two parts to that. First of all, there's the part that people will just want cheap energy. And they are, I think, and I, I know that people disagree with me, I, they, part of the reason why this backlash comes is because so expensive things were done first and the customers haven't seen the benefits of those. That's why I always argued, be very careful with customers' money to carry them with you. But further out, I'm with Tom. 
I think when the costs start to flash out about what climate change is actually costing, we may do it later than is necessary to uh, stabilise. Politicians may want to drag, but in the end, when the public sees it, it's a bit like air quality. We put up with this air quality in London for a couple of decades. It's awful. Actually, the evidence is now mounting. And all I'm doing as an outsider is that I can't determine what the politics is, but I'm trying to shine a torch. Okay? I'm trying to say, this is the reality you work this to. And then, again, you might think I'm wildly optimistic, but you know, back to my, my thesis with my Tipex and my carbon thing in 1984, right? If you'd have told me I have this amazing computer in my pocket, which can tap the internet and do all this kind of stuff, I'd have thought you were a complete lunatic. And when I look around the university and research world, what I see is all the bright young guys, they're not economists anymore. They've learnt the lessons about the great high days of that. They are actually in the science, and what really fires them up is cracking these energy technologies. I have never seen such engagement. Will it work? I don't know. Do I hope it works? It has to work. If it doesn't, we still have to, may have to do the decarbonisation, but it'd be very, very expensive and, and, and costly to do it if these things don't work. And that's essentially the space I'm on. Are we burning down? I don't know. Ralph, any idea? Not scheduled. We're not scheduled to burn down. Right. Not scheduled to burn down. It would be slightly <laughs> ironic with the title of the book. Yes, right. Um, let, uh, it normally goes on and on and on if there's a real fire, so I think we're okay. Um, Michael, somebody, you somebody should check. Yes. Yeah, somebody should. I can see our office manager, so I'm sure we'll be. Is it okay? Are we burning okay. down? I think, don't worry. Okay, don't great. worry. Good. Don't worry. Um, Michael, did you want to come Well, on maybe ju just quickly. Um, one. I, I hope you didn't feel too lonely in um, you know, fossil fuel predictions. Um, I, I think it was a bit of a minority sport, but in the climate change committee, certainly I kind of said, you know, if you assume these kind of high projections, you're being pretty anti-historical, the lessons of history is whenever you've had a world shock, something happened. Um, but I, I think the key thing is, it just meant that we're operating in a, in a sea of uncertainty and hugely divergent views. To some extent, were captured in the scenarios basically said, well, plan for these kind of range of mm. fossil fuel mm. prices. What I think is important about the, the technological change that's happened is that it slightly redefines that old question of can't solve climate change because China's going to burn all the coal. Mm. It's got loads of coal, so it'll burn it. And, and actually, we slightly doubted that, but the technology basically means well, the question is okay, do you want to leave the coal in the ground or some of the gas, or do you want to leave your solar untapped or your wind are untapped? You've got various resources, it's a matter of public policy choice. Which ones you're going to use, which ones you're not going to use. Uh, and I think a final remark on how that links back to the political question, it dawned on me one thing one could consider in a manifesto is saying that given where they are now, energy bills overall probably do not need to go up. Yeah. But that is very different from saying that you know, you're, you're the specific retail price per kilowatt will never go up, because what matters is the confluence of price and consumption levels and the other options you have. The lesson of history is actually countries spend between 6 and, 12, 6 and 10 percent of their uh, GDP on energy, and that's been one of the great constants, uh, which I think there are some very interesting lessons to be had in that. I think we've got time for one final question. Let's go to the gentleman over here on this side. Philippe Carpentier, independent uh, trader and consultant. Um, I wanted to pick on a point that uh, Dieter mentioned and Tom also mentioned about the system architecture and the fact that we're transitioning from, uh, well, transitioning, we have currently a hybrid of a capacity market and a wholesale market. Uh, my question is quite simple. Is how, well, simple. The answer is not not simple, and I'm sure it's part of a, a lot of policy debates and so on. But how do you see that transitioning in the next few years, given the difficulties we've had with the capacity auctions in the last uh, two, three years? If I can just add a, a supplementary yeah, please. observation rather than question, really. But you talk a lot in the book about capacity, capacity auctions, but one of the interesting things that we've seen is actually the value of capacity in the capacity auctions has been very low. The value of flexibility 
flexible capacity yeah. Yeah. appears to be very high and increasingly important if you've got a world yeah. with lots of wind and solar. Yeah, okay. Anyway. So, I mean, actually, it's a very detailed question, so I'm going to give a very simple answer, okay? On the first point, as was mentioned by Tom and I think Michael, um, the hot topic in economics is how to evaluate the economics of different systems. systems. So almost all of cost-benefit analysis is based on marginal analysis. Yes. Given a system, what's the cost of that system of making a marginal incremental change? Okay. So before I really got, well, I've always been interested in energy, but, but pre previously, and I'm in 210 with the policy exchange, I've always worked on infrastructures. Okay. And looking about questions like, do you want a high-speed rail system? Do you want a water catchment system? Do you want a broadband system? Okay? And this decarbonisation process and the digital technologies means that what we've had for 100 years plus in electricity of a system based on passive demand right, and no storage is the reason why the structure of the costs of the industry produce a vertical integrated outcome. So they are the right answer the big six the and all the rest question. of them, for the question of the last century. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, Absolutely. as you go forward, the question then becomes, how do you adjust? Right? Now, I didn't say the wholesale market's going to go away tomorrow. Right? Not a bit. Okay? And so there are two, two bits to your question. The first is, how do we do capacity in the big picture? And the, the narrower question is, how do we do flexibility of the system in the short and the medium term? On the big picture, I've always advocated a merger of the FITs and the capacity market to a single unified two-stage auction. If you're technically minded, it's been on my website for at least five years and I've been setting that out. Okay? Um, on the flexible issue, this really has come to the fore. And it doesn't come to the fore until the system has got enough intermittent stuff on it, so enough wind and enough solar, you suddenly think, uh, we really got to deal with this. This isn't just sort of easily adapted, okay? So you start to ask questions about it. Now, there are two ways of doing the flexibility. One is to use a wholesale market type mechanism, which is a very short-term spot price. It goes all over the place, right? Okay? The other one is to do what lots of other markets do, which is to have an insurance contract, okay? So you contract for the insurance that will cover those things, and you pay them a fixed price for being available. I think the current capacity market and the current fits are not perfectly designed. You wouldn't expect them to be. My fear about the capacity market is how it works is roughly this. So you have a capacity auction and the government knows what answer it wants. I'm making this up, right? But, you know, you can think this through, okay? It knows what answer it was. It asked the market, and hey, the market, market doesn't the give answer. them the answer it thought it was going to get because actually markets are used because you don't know the right answer. Yeah. So you think, oh, what a pity. Right, we'll have a quick reform and review. So as soon as you finish one auction, you have a review, and we'll bodge it up a bit to try and get the answer we really wanted. Okay? And that's what's happened so far. And actually what's missing from that frame is a serious system operator thought about the structure of this frame. And I would add just one final thing. The cost of having too much capacity and too much flexibility on, this, on the system in a digital world are utterly trivial compared with the cost of not doing it. And one of the reasons electricity prices are so high, which people keep forgetting, they seem to say, oh, the wholesale price has moved. Why has the wholesale price been moved? Because the capacity margin is very tight. If you have a big capacity margin, wholesale prices would be a lot lower than they currently are. And we're running our capacity on a very tight margin. And just a final, final, final point, just to link to something that, 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 that was said uh, across here by particularly uh, uh, John. On electricity prices, in my world of a decent capacity margin, we are paying too much because the wholesale price is too high. And we're paying too much because we're paying an electricity or gas only, unswitched consumer market with margins which are not 0.1 but they're way north of it and I would just when those people who think that there should be nothing done about margins in electricity <coughs> supply I would remind you that the last time that supply was fixed or the time before last when it was fixed for the supply margin in Northern Ireland for a small player with very low economies of scale it was 1.7 okay you know it is a sort of practical question why does anybody need these kinds of margins to flog electricity or flog gas? Right? And the answer is because people don't switch. 
that's part of the reason why these margins exist. So part of the technical change on your broadband hub will change this, and part of it will change by having a proper wholesale mechanism. And that then creates a framework in which people pay fair prices for electricity. And I propose, and it's on my website if I'm interested, how you should do a tariff which is fair but not regulated. So the margin is explicit and available to encourage entrants to come into it. But I think the government's absolutely right. And the idea that the solution to our energy market today is say, oh, you know, if you want to intervene, you're against the free market. As I tell my students, there are no free markets. Yeah. Markets exist in rules, property rights, frameworks. I ask my students what they think the most capitalist market, free market in the world is, and sometimes they mistakenly say the stock market. And then I turn around and say, can you tell me a more regulated market in the world than the stock market? It's about markets in frameworks and context. And that is what we're edging towards, but that's what has to be addressed after the election. And I really fear for some knee-jerk cap without thinking through how this relates to the world I've tried to describe if you were to just entertain the possibility that some of what I've said might actually be correct. And if you want any more on that, you can check out the article I did in the Telegraph yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> like that. An absolute price gap is a terrible idea. Um, very did any of the other panellists have any other closing remarks? Well, just a, brilliant yes, sorry, just a very quick one on that, on, on that subject. Another way of putting what Dieter just said is we don't have a hardware problem, we have a software problem. If you account the regulatory system for the market as software, and then the software you need to manage the data idea. flows that allow you to create a flexible system, then we have a software problem, not a hardware problem. Almost everybody in the, who thinks about this in the business world and in the uh, uh, political world thinks we have a hardware problem, and we don't. And if you look at the result of what Dieter just described, we have an electricity system in which you have 74 gig probably generating capacity, something like that, on the system. Peak demand for half an hour in the coldest half hour in the winter is about 54 gig. And for a good part of the year, you need about 30 gig. Now, if you try to run an airline on that kind of capital utilization factor, you'd be out of business pretty damn quickly. We've got to, and that's what the flexibility piece will get you, we've got to have better capital utilization. So one thing the government could do is not, not load the market so you build more big things which erode that capacity to uh, get flexibility okay, uh, in I, the system. I think we disagree. I want to do both. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, for choice. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, th I, 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 I actually think we should build one or two big gas stations at this stage as insurance. Oh, well, so we might differ. We're, we're only arguing at the margin. Yeah. 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 Michael yeah. or John, any other, be some uh, any other thoughts? I think, You're that's okay. I think that's captured core issues very well. Brilliant. Um, so I'd just like to, to thank Dieter for the excellent presentation and discussion and the other panellists. Um, I thought that's been a really stimulating uh, session. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's books at the back. Uh, if you want to take one away, um, and there's stuff you can check out on our website on some similar issues as well. Thank you for coming along. Thank you.